Welcome to Family Church. We are so glad that you're joining us again. We are still in the middle of our sermon series called The Hall of Faith, where we are looking at those characters that the author of Hebrews said, these guys from the Old Testament were so amazing at their ability to take the faith, the shield of faith that God had given them and said in their hearts, I am going to trust God and move forward with them. So we are in the book of Hebrews, but you'll notice that when we talk about Hebrews 11, we're often there for like a verse or two, and then we're looking somewhere else. So if you would actually turn to Judges, that's where our main character is going to be. But I want to read you what it says in Hebrews 11, and I'll just have it up here for you. So here's what it said. It's actually the same verse that Pastor Drew spoke from last week. And it says this, and what more shall we say? I do not have time to tell you about Gideon. That's what Pastor Drew talked about. Barak, Samson, Jephthah, and about David and Samuel and the prophets who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions. I don't know if you're catching this, but you got to read this with some bravado. You don't go and shut the mouths of lions. He quenched the, they quenched the fury of the flames, and they escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned into strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Raise your hand if you want to be with those guys. Yeah. Don't we all? Here's a little bit of like the problem I have, and we've talked about this before, but Hebrews is painting the picture, pointing at the faith parts. They often don't point out the failure parts. And we feel like it's really important that we talk about the mess as well. Where did our people struggle? Okay, and I want you to remember back, last week we talked about Gideon, and what we saw in Gideon, he was a very insecure guy. Well, this week we're going to talk about, you know, Gideon would be the most insecure kid in the class. Today we're going to talk about the coolest cat in the class, the guy who seemed to have everything together. We know that he was strong and that God had a plan for his life from before he was born. Today we're going to look at a guy named Samson. And here's what I need you to know about Samson. I need you to bring first everything you already think you know about Samson. Usually two things stand out. Because of what you've read in a kid's Bible, you think of two things. Number one, Before he was born, an angel of the Lord came to his father and mother and said, you're going to have a son. He's going to do something special. And they they gave a Nazarite vow. Now, a Nazarite vow said really two things. One is he couldn't have alcohol or strong drink and never cut his hair because God was going to do something with him. And uh, so the parents agree, and so they never cut his hair. So if you think about this, the most famous thing about Samson is probably his hair. You didn't know this, but he actually was a spokesperson for Head & Shoulders right there at the beginning when Head & Shoulders was just coming in. He was the first spokesperson for them because he would have these amazing locks of hair. So that's one of the things that we think about. The second thing we think about usually comes because we are inferring something. Now, when you know the story of Samson, we know that he was the strongest man that ever lived, that God's power would come on him, and then he would do these amazing things. He would rip gates off of their, uh, off of their hinges and then carry them off. He would kill thousands of people all at one time because he was so incredibly strong. He could break chains and cords and ropes, and he just was an, a big, well, we would think of him as a big guy. Partly because when we look at our kids' Bibles, little Bibles, they have the little pictures in there, the muscles are amazing. But I was talking with one of our elders at one point, and he said a really interesting point that I had never thought of. He said, you do realize the Bible never said he was huge. I said, yeah, look what all he could do. And he said, but wait, when did he do those things? It was every time the power of God came on him. So I started doing some research, and we looked with um, some anthropology, and we looked at some archaeology, and we actually have been able to discover what he actually looked like. Samson was actually five foot four and weighed 120 pounds. He looked exactly like this. Notice the ripped biceps. No, no, he doesn't have it at all. Now, do we know what he looked like? We have no idea, but here's what I want you to understand. When you think of the big muscles, you think it's Samson. This is not a story just of Samson. There's two parallel stories happening simultaneously. There is a man named Samson, a flawed individual named Samson. But simultaneously, there is the story of God moving forward. He has a purpose and he has a plan. And he uses his strength to do amazing things. So if you could do something for me, every time you see a picture of Samson and you see ripped muscles, say, maybe. But remember this. This is also the story of the power of God, not just the story of a man. Okay, so as we're looking at this, you can have Barney Fife in the back of your mindset. But I want to tell you a little bit about the story of Samson. And I'll be shoot straight with you. I'm not a huge fan of Samson. I'm really not. Uh, I'm not a fan of the way that he acted, the choices that he made. And and out of that, you may hear me sometimes point at the way that he's acting. And you may hear me judging him. That's probably a problem. 
In fact, I want to challenge you. Sometimes we do this. We take a Bible character and we revere them and say, man, I wish I could be like that. Or we look at their failures and go, I would never do that. Well, let me tell you something. You too are living two parallel stories. You are living your story, but you are also living a story within the context of God's story. And so come with me today a little bit more humbly where um, I know I'm tempted to judge. And I'd ask you to if you're tempted to do that too with the story of Samson, to pull back on that and say, what is the story of God doing with a flawed individual? And he is flawed. In fact, you picked up, as soon as the first time we see him after his birth, we see him making what I would say is a poor decision. His goal and the mission that he has been given by an angel of God who came and visited his parents is that he is going to help overthrow the Philistines. And the first thing we see is that he's found a really, a really pretty girl that he wants to marry, and guess what nationality she is? She's a Philistine. And so he goes and says, I want to marry this girl. His parents give a little caution, and he says, I, get her for me. And so they do. And it sets up the wedding. He doesn't have any friends to come to this wedding, so they have to borrow 30 people to become the companions of Samson. And so they go uh, to the wedding feast that usually lasts about seven days. And he sets out a riddle for his 30 companions. Now remember, these are supposed to be his friends, but really, and I can't prove this, but I always pictured that they actually had to pay these people to come. Which, by the way, if you guys are looking for a side gig, how great would that be? Go to a feast for seven days and you might even be paid for it. But in the process, he sets up this riddle for them and they can't figure it out. And there's a wager on this too. So here's a, he gives a riddle. He says, you figure it out before the end of the feast. If you can't do it, you can each give me a set of clothes. And if, and if you figure it out, I'll give each of you a set of clothes. Well, they can't figure it out. So they go to his new wife and say, hey, figure it out, get it to us, or we're going to burn you and your dad's house down. Well, that puts a lot of pressure on that woman. So she goes to Samson, and she just plays that card. Samson, if you really love me, you tell me. That. And finally, he gives in and says, and he tells her, and he trusts his new wife. His new wife goes, thinking that she's saving her life and the life of her father, tells them. And of course, the very next day, they come out and say, hey, and they answer the riddle, and Samson is furious. One of the things I want you to notice about Samson is anger is an underlying current in his story. And so he goes out, and he kills 30 men, 30 Philistines, grabs all of their clothes, brings them back, and pays the debt. But in the process, he is so upset about it that it, he does not let this go. Finally, sometime later, after the anger calms down, he goes back to see his wife, and the father has already given her to someone else. Now he's really mad. And so he grabs, I don't, he gets 300 foxes, ties their tails together. And we ask the question, how in the world did they get 300 foxes? Who catches 300 foxes? And someone said, well, God brought them to him, two by two. Some of you take a while to get that joke. But anyway, he gets them. He takes them two by two, ties their tails together, and then lights a torch in between the tails and sets them out in the Philistines' wheat fields and basically burns the place down. He has that scorched earth mentality. Literally, anger killing. Anger, burn it down. And now we have a problem. And now we have a cycle that's going on. At one point, he ends up trapped inside of one of the Philistine cities. Uh, to get out, he simply rips off the door hinges the gates off the hinges. And you can see, look how ripped he is. No, no, no. Picture Barney Fife, okay? If you guys are a little bit um, older, maybe um, Pee Wee Herman, I can't think of anyone from right now. But picture someone really small carrying them off. So in the process, though, after he burns everything down, the Philistines are upset. So they go and do a raid against Judea. And they say, basically the Judeans say, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? And they said, man, the Samson is bothering us, and if, if you, we don't take care of him, we will, we're going to keep attacking you. So 3,000 guys from Judah go down, and they find Samson, and they say to him, hey, we have a problem. We need you to stop this. And he said, here's the deal. As long as you don't kill me, why don't you just bind me up and hand me over to them? Which, of course, is a setup. Remember, the power of God is in him. He's the strongest man that ever lived because of this parallel story of God in him. And so the, uh, the, the, the guys from Judah, they tie him up with brand new ropes. They take him and they give him over to the Philistines. And then there's this great moment, probably one of the most famous moments uh, for the Samson's life. He rips the, the cords off. He takes the ropes and just shreds them. And then he picks up the only weapon he can find around, the jawbone of a donkey and the thousand men that are there to guard him, to cover him, to take him back and to kill him. Yeah, he uh, opens up with the jawbone and starts annihilating them. And I have to say, 
it felt to me, like as I was listening to Drew last week, he was pretty excited about Gideon and the odds. I don't know if you remember that, but he was talking about in the end, 300 guys went against 135,000 and won, and this is amazing. And I'm like, hey, Drew, great job. I know you're excited. But I was looking at my guy. <laughs> His odds? 1,000 to 1. And it wasn't ratio. It was actually 1,000 Philistines versus one. One guy and a jawbone. And what did he do? Just ripped them to shreds, tore them apart. One of these great stories where we see the power of God do something amazing. He fights himself free. Well, he has a problem, though. You know, remember I said that uh, we often see the, the faith of the guys, especially if we're just reading Hebrews 11, but we don't see the flaws, we don't see the failures. One of the flaws that, that Samson had was a relationship that he had with a woman named Delilah. Now, Delilah, I don't know much about her other than the way that she handled herself in relationship to Samson. He liked her, and the Philistines knew that. By the way, she was a Philistine. Again, a problem. He is um, creating relationships with what should be the enemy. And in the process, he's talking with her. She finds out that the Philistines wanted to capture him, and they want to know the secret of his strength. So they say they're going to pay her an exorbitant amount of money. Like a whole group of them say, we'll each give you like 1,100 shekels of silver. Uh, just a, an enormous sum of money. And so she goes to Samson and says, how can I get him to tell me his secret? And so over the course of time, Samson, you're so strong and handsome. What, what's your secret to your strength? Tell me all about it. And, and over and over again, three times, he tells her, the secret to his strength, and of course he's just, he's just playing with her, he doesn't do it. Well, she actually does the thing that he says would take his strength away. You would think that he would learn, this is not a woman to be trusted, but he just keeps going back and keeps the relationship going. Three times he tricks her, and finally in the end, she says, you don't love me. Oh, excuse me. <clears throat> you don't love me. If you love me, you would tell me. And in the end, he actually gives in and capitulates and tells her what his strength comes from. He is tricked again, and in the, in the night after he falls asleep, he, he, obviously it's a COVID haircut too, by the way, they shave off his hair, his strength is gone. Interestingly enough, when the Philistines come in and they grab him, he doesn't have any strength to, to go back and fight against them, so they put him to work, pushing around a millstone. And notice the muscles are still there, but the strength is gone. This is part of the reason I would say I don't know that it was all about the strength of muscles, because if, if that were the case, after the hair's gone, he'd still be ripped. Notice that the picture doesn't show him as Barney Fife now, but the power of God has left him. But over time, it says that his hair began to grow back, and for the first time that we see in the story, we actually see him pray. And he says, God, would you return my strength that I may avenge what happened to me because they had blinded him, and he wants some vengeance, but also I think that God is moving some things in his heart where he is humbled. Well, at one point, they brought him out to entertain him to entertain the people. There's a really big party with all the leaders of the Philistines. Like 3,000 people are at this temple. And they bring Samson in, and uh, there's a little servant boy, and the servant boy brings him in, and, and Samson says, put me next to the pillars that hold the place up. And so they bring him in, and I'll tell you, Samson is an amazing entertainer. He brought the house down on those people. Okay, that's the only joke you're getting today, so... You better embrace it. What he does is he leans on the pillars, each of them, and he pushes against both of them, and the whole thing comes down. And 3,000 of the leaders of the Philistines are all crushed that day. By the way, when the house came down, it sounded like quaboo, okay? Some people think it was kabam. It's not. It's quaboo, all right? So he brings the house down. The end of his life, he ends up killing more people in his death than he had in his life when he was fighting against the Philistines. Now we look at this story, we do see an echo and a chorus of faith and also we see a strain of faults in there. And I want to walk through some of the faults and I want you to see how, one, the danger of these faults because there's some that we inherently carry. But I also want you to see that there's also this, this strain of God's story that's being weaved in them. The first thing that I noticed about Samson that I think is really dangerous comes from the story of his relationship to the wife that he went and married the Philistine wife. This is what it says in Judges 14, starting at verse 2. When he returned, he said to his father and mother, I have seen a Philistine woman in Timnah. Now get her for me as my wife. Now his father and mother replied, there, um, Isn't there an acceptable woman among your relatives or among all the people? Must you go to the uncircumcised Philistines to get a wife? Great caution. Hey, remember, your whole purpose here was to overthrow them. What are you doing? Why would you do this? But listen to his response. He's given wisdom 
But in response, it says, but Samson said to his father, get her for me. She's the right one for me. And the first thing that I want you to see about Samson is I think that Samson was arrogant. This is one of those places where I would be cautious when you judge him. Instead of judging Samson, say, how am I similar to this? How easy is it for you to hear someone bring criticism to you? To say, hey, the choice you're making isn't good. Hey, the direction you're headed is dangerous. How easy is it for you to hear someone say, you might want to make a course correction? Remember last week, Gideon was insecure. This is a moment where you see the opposite. You see Samson with arrogance. But I think this, it's, the, it's the opposite side of the same coin. It's all about each of them. But one of the sad things I see in the life of Samson that I don't see in the life of Gideon, Gideon began insecure, and you could see faith grow in him. Samson, I don't see actually any moral change throughout his stories. There's a little hint of it at the very, very end. But for the most part, this is a guy who walks in arrogance, and God is using him in spite of himself, not necessarily because of the faith we see in him. You know what else I'm just noticing? When you have an arrogant person, you'll often echo out with an angry person. Now, I think this can also be true in insecurity. But boy, it sure comes out in Samson. When he was tricked, the anger that was there. When his uh, wife was given away, the anger that's the response. How often that happens. I want to ask you just that, that question about how well do you take criticism? Raise your hand if you're one of those people, and I want you to do this wherever you are, even if you're sitting by yourself. Raise your hand if you're someone that has a strong personality, that when you walk into the room, you come in, you're a dominant type person, okay? And then raise your hand if you are someone who, when you walk into the room, you kind of sit to the back. You're more of a wallflower. Raise your hand. My guess is that for the most part, on the strong personality, that's about 20 to 25% of the people. You know what I've noticed about strong people? They have no problem going up to someone else and saying, hey, you uh." you got to change that. Well, what happens when the person that needs to be changed is a strong person? And I, I'll give you this challenge. One, are you willing to hear criticism? But then I would also say, for those of you who are a little bit more um, passive, are you willing to speak truth? And imagine how hard it would be. We only see one time when someone speaks truth to Samson, and his response is not great. And you can imagine how hard it would be. You've heard the stories. Remember how he ripped the lion apart? Remember how we killed a thousand men with a jawbone? And you just imagine it. You're coming up, hey, Samson, I want to talk to you. And he's holding the jawbone. What? Yeah. Uh, you know what? Never mind. Nice weather today, isn't it? Yeah, I'll, I'll see you. Here's what I want you to know, though. Paul has said this many, many times. You have information that is critical to the success of the people in your life. And that for those of you who are a little bit more timid, it's important that you're willing to speak truth. And for all of us, you need to hear this. It's important for us to hear truth. And I would remind you this, that when we speak truth, we speak truth in love, that we do it with graciousness and we do it with a heart that says we care more about you and we're willing to step out and say, I know that you need this, but we're going to do it in a gracious way. I don't see that it's very easy to speak to arrogant people like Samson, but it's so critical that we do. How sad is it that if you look at the stories I told, we never hear again of anyone coming to him with a caution. Do you realize that David had, Samuel, or David had Nathan come to him and say, hey, you're wrong. And Saul had Samuel come to him. And Peter had Paul. Throughout the scripture, we see where there's one person who steps in front of another and says, stop, wait. Wait, I, I think what you're doing is dangerous. And we don't see anyone being willing to do that for him. You see, what happens when you live this way long enough and no one's speaking to you anymore? You'll, you'll live in that state that, you, that you're born into. You'll live an echo out of self-centeredness. And I think that's exactly where Samson lived for the majority of his life, even in his death. He doesn't say, God, move in me again so that I can do your will. He says, move in me again so that I can avenge my eyes. Even at the, his very best, his most humble, he still comes with some mixed motives. And I would just challenge you, whether or not it's insecurity or arrogance, whatever stems out of this, what part of your life is, is based around this self-centeredness? So we move on in the, in the story. It, it comes out um, again where... Um, where he, when he goes to, to get married, there's this part where, where they have to find companions to come with him. When the people saw him, they chose 30 men to be his companions. Why in the world would they have to go pick guys to be his companions? Because he didn't have any friends. He was an isolated man. He lived separate from other people, and I see this in a number of ways. He, they have to get friends for him. 
The other thing that I noticed, the only time we see him with the people that he was leading, the Israelites, is one time when 3,000 of them came to him. There's not one story of him leading them. He's with their enemy, trying to get married to one. He's with their enemy, Delilah, having a relationship with her. But at no point do we see him with them. He's never inspiring the people. He's never connected with them. He's never in relationship. You know, one of the things that we, we say we're so important here at Family Church, one of them is transformation. And as I was saying, Samson lacks transformation throughout the course of his story. The other thing that he lacks is he lacks our second value here at Family Church. He lacks relationship. He lives an isolated life only one time does he ever uh, get together with Israel. Another thing that I see too is, imagine if you knew Samson and you knew he was in a dangerous, horrible relationship with a woman like Delilah. Wouldn't you stand up and say, hey, bad idea, you probably shouldn't be with her. And yet nobody does. You just, just pause for a second. Raise your hand if you think it's a good idea for Samson to hang with, with Delilah. Okay, keep your hand up if you think Delilah is a good influence on Samson. Hands up, good. Okay, here's what I need you to do. Look around the room. Anyone with their hand up, don't trust those people, okay? Because they are bad news. They're, of course, Delilah is a horrible, horrible influence on Samson. But he doesn't have a life group that's sitting there going, hey, on a Thursday morning, on a Tuesday night, or on a Saturday afternoon going, uh, hey, dude, you're telling me your story here, and it sure sounds like on your spiritual pathway, you're headed towards a dangerous end. You might want to reconsider. She's asking you for a secret that God gave. This is not a good idea. But who's going to say anything to him? Nobody. Maybe because of his arrogance, but he is an isolated man. You know what happens when you become isolated? You'll become self-reliant. You will say, and of all the people, remember if you're tempted to judge Samson, just stop and think about what it would be like to be him. You are the strongest man that's ever lived. Anytime you walk into danger, you have the ability to throw off the danger and move forward. I think it'd be pretty tempting and pretty easy to live an isolated life, to be self-reliant, because every time he doesn't even notice sometimes, I think that it was actually God. I think he sometimes, he becomes self-reliant because he forgets he's living inside God's story. I think he's living inside his own story in his mind, which leads to a problem. As we were talking about this, Pastor Paul said, man, I just saw this verse this morning in my quiet time, and, and this is what it said. And he said, and this is from the New Testament, so this is thousands of years later, but it really echoes out the same problem. Indeed, we felt we had received a sentence of death, but this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God, these people, the church, they were in trouble and they were being persecuted and they, were, they felt like they were getting a sentence of death. And said, but look at the beauty of it. We're learning to rely not on ourselves, but on God. Remember that self-centered, self-reliant? You know, boy, when you're in a place when you have nothing you can do but trust him, you're going to learn to rely on him and not on yourself. So I just want to ask you, where are you the self-reliant type? I think you know what I mean here. The type of person who says, whenever something goes wrong, I'll just pull myself up by the bootstraps and do it on my own. I had a friend. This is the nature of, I've had tons of friends that are like this where when something needs to be done, they're unwilling to step out and say, hey, would you help me? And you can tell the trajectory of change in their life when they step out and they're willing to say, hey, would you come help be a part of this? I need your help. As we move on, we've seen that he's arrogant, and we see that he's isolated. We see, see that he's self-centered and that he's self-reliant, but I want you to see a little bit more. I'm going to carry on in the story. Uh, when he's with Delilah and multiple times, she has tried to trick him, and he falls for it. Well, he tricks her back, and finally, in the end, he falls for it. He says, it says he was wearied by her nagging. And so he says, here is, here's the secret. And he falls asleep, and she cuts off his hair. And as he wakes up, she says to him, the Philistines are upon you. Samson, wake up. And when he woke from his sleep, he thought, I'll go out as before and shake myself free. Right, because he's self-reliant. Like, yeah, I've got this. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. This is probably the saddest line in the entire story. He had become so used to the power of God moving through him that he had forgot to know what it felt like to have that relationship with God. And there he is. His hair is cut. He gets up thinking he's going to throw off the enemy and he has no power to do so. And he wasn't even aware that the power of God had left him. 
Next thing I want you to see is he's arrogant and isolated, but he's also, he's also unaware. I think this is a more real for all of us than we know. I don't think we realize how sinful we are and that uh, our actions put us in a place that rip us apart and we're not even aware that our sin is destroying relationships around us and, and destroying relationship with God. This is the only time we see him pray, though, is after he is humbled. Interestingly enough, the word humbled in the text only comes up when it's talking about the Philistines wanting to humble him, and they do it. This is the first time we see even a glimmer of it that he begins to pray. I'm going to make this personal for you for a second. When it comes to your relationship with God, over the last five months, life has changed a little bit. And some of the structures that were around you that helped you in your relationship with God, whether or not it's life groups or maybe it's church on the weekends, those have been stripped away for, for unless you were really willing to be committed and saying, no, I'm in no matter what, I'm going to be a part of it. A lot of those have been stripped away and relationships are frayed. You know what I've noticed for a lot of us? Our relationship with God was built on having these other structures. And when you pull them away, we find out we were a lot more wobbly. And those are wonderful structures. Scripture says, don't give up meeting together. You need those structures. But it also can reveal when we can't do it, how much we were relying on them and we weren't necessarily relying on God. I want you to, uh, to see something out of this. Is that sometimes, like Samson, we are simply self-deceived. We are really thinking we're living a story of our own, not realizing the power and the story that God is is actually working in this time. But I do want you to see something, too. I want you to see the power of God in this. We're talking about people that make it into the hall of faith. I have been complaining all week long. Why is Samson in this? Because I've got a lot of characters from the Old Testament that I think are much better suited. Why is Daniel not in here? But Samson gets in. Every one of his stories, it seems like Samson is messing up. But Daniel doesn't make it in. Elijah, Elisha, Joshua, Esther. Why? Why isn't Ruth in there? And I think the, the beauty of this and the reason that God puts him in there is because it reveals that there's a story that's bigger than the character of the person. Now, all of these people are flawed on some level, but it seems like you have an overtly flawed guy. But I want you to hear this, that there are two stories happening simultaneously. In fact, there's a part of a verse that I, I read to you earlier, and I want to bring it back around. I actually cut out the second half of it. I didn't show it to you. It's this first, one of the first verses I read. Remember the part where Samson wanted the wife, and he wouldn't listen to his parents? His parents say this, and... She, and, and he says to them, get her for me. She's the right one for me. Look at the rest of this. It says in, in parentheses, his parents did not know that this was from the Lord who was seeking an occasion to confront the Philistines. Now let me say something clearly. There was a sin that Samson was going to commit. His parents tried to stop him. Here's what his parents didn't know. That God was going to use this very thing to spark it. Now, it doesn't make it right. This is still a sin. Samson is making a choice in his story. And God says, mm -hmm, I see that. I'll use that sin. Re read this carefully. This is not God saying, I am making Samson do something wrong. No, I'm going to use it, though. And this is something that sparks. Now, the Philistines are a rival of Israel for a long time. In fact, the most famous Philistine is not Delilah. His name is actually, I almost called him Samson. His name is actually Goliath who fights David. That's about two generations away. And I want you to hear this. The hand of God was moving here in Samson's foolishness and in all that he did. You remember at the very end of his life when he pushes the columns over and he brings down the house on 3,000? I don't know if you caught it. 3,000 of the leaders of the Philistines. In 40 years, Samuel and Saul are going to be on the scene fighting the Philistines. Samson's part of what crippled that kingdom. And then one generation later, King David is going to rise up and overthrow the Philistines. This is God's story. This is not Samson's story. Samson gets to play a bit role, a very small role. And despite all of his flaws, God is moving. And this leads me to a question for you. Which story are you living in? Are you only aware of your story or are you aware of God's powerful story? It's a great question that I've heard asked before. Whose kingdom are you building? Are you building God's kingdom or your own kingdom? If you think about that, that's a great question for pastors. Are they just trying to build big churches for themselves? 
Is it all about them or is this God's story? And when you're thinking about building the kingdom of God or the kingdom of the pastor, it's a great question. But I want to strip that away because this is not a pastor question. This is a story, a question for every single person walking in a relationship with God because you too can be, be, be building your own kingdom. Mothers and fathers, just in your own home, is your home the reason for your home, for your comfort, for you to have things the way that you want them? How angry do you get when things aren't the way that you want them? Or is the purpose, the kingdom that you are building is what you're pouring into each other? And out of, out of that pouring into each other, you're actually pouring in to, to, to point them towards the kingdom of God? Or are you building your own kingdom? When you're at work, are you about your kingdom and making you look good? You see, some people, when, they, when they're working on a kingdom, they're working on expanding their kingdom. They're like, look at me. But then there are other people who are doing the exact same thing in reverse. What they're doing is they're protecting their kingdom and they're putting a wall up saying, don't make me look bad. All the while, the question is, is the self more important than the Savior? Is the self more important than the Savior? And if the self is there, it's going to be about expanding the kingdom or protecting the kingdom, but it's going to be a small kingdom. It's going to be a personal kingdom. It's not going to be a God-sized kingdom. And I believe God is calling us into a God-sized story, which means those of us who are arrogant will need to be humbled. And those of us who are insecure will need to grow in faith. And those of us who struggle with isolation will need to step out and be a part of community. And those of us, which is all of us, who are unaware of the power of God and unaware of the sin inside of us, will need to be open to say, God, move in my heart. God, change who I am. I want to pray for us, and then I have a, a question that we're going to center in on. Lord Jesus, what a humbling story to see a man who wasn't humbled. God, I pray that you would give us a humility to evaluate in a way that Samson didn't, to hear in a way that Samson didn't, to be aware in a way that Samson wasn't so that we can see that your story is a better story and that we can join in with you. God, I love the truth that your story is going to go on and you're going to win, but God, I pray that I would get to be more like someone that's Abraham or Moses or David, someone like Daniel and Esther, someone that's more like Elijah, that when, when a push comes to shove, there's a teachability, there's a heart that hears, and there's a, there's a connectivity, and there's an awareness of you. God, I pray that you would grow that in us. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, I have a question for you. And it's going to look oddly familiar, but I hope your answers are different today. Listen carefully to it. It's the exact same question we asked last, year, last week for the story of Gideon. But last week we were talking about the insecurity and where our faith needs to go. Listen to the question. Where do you need to focus less on yourself and more on God? This time, though, I want you not to think about what is wrong. I want you to think about where your arrogance is. Where is it that you think you are self-sufficient? You get a second chance at the exact same question. I love you guys, and we will see you soon.